Welcome, everyone. So good to see you all. Welcome to Past and Present with Allison Gilbert and her guests, Tembi Locke and Jenny Lisk. My name is Andy Engel. I am Senior Programmer at Reimagine. Our mission is to help people of all backgrounds face adversity, loss, mortality, all the hard stuff, and channel that into meaningful action and growth. I'd like to thank for grief. Their support for this series is invaluable. Here are some Zoom tips. Um, note that you can view a transcription of what we're all saying by clicking on the CC icon at the bottom of your screen. The majority of us are zooming in from the United States, also known as Turtle Island, by Native Americans and their allies. Allison and I are in Len Lenape Hoking. That area covers the New York metro area. Tell us where you are in the chat. And if you're curious about the indigenous territory where you're located, you can check this link out in the chat, native-land.ca. Uh, and I also want you to mark your calendars for the next past and present. It will be on July 28th. Um, Allison's guest is James Harris, who is an author, a mental health counselor, veteran, entrepreneur, and he's also a past reimagined presenter on our Table Talk series. The topic is men's grief, um, a set of experiences and feelings that men rarely discuss. And uh, seeing a black male therapist in the world of clinical counseling is like a unicorn sighting. It's quite rare. Um, he fills a critical need in underrepresented communities. So please join us for that. And I'll be pasting a link in the chat later for that. And now uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Allison. Allison Gilbert is the author of numerous books, including the forthcoming biography of Hearst newspaper columnist, Elsie Robinson, to be published by Basic Books Hatchet in September. Her most recent book, Past and Present, Keeping Memories of Loved Ones Alive, reveals creative waves to remember family and friends we never want to forget. And you can follow Allison on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. She's everywhere at A Gilbert Writer. And with that, it's my pleasure to hand this over to Allison, who will introduce our guests. Thank you so much, Andy. And I am so grateful for Reimagine, for, for Grief, for allowing us to come together as we do the last Thursday of every month. I look forward to these conversations so much. It is the highlight of my month. And I mean that truly from the bottom of my heart. I feel like this hour that I get to talk with the most preeminent writers, thinkers, thought leaders on grief, remembrance, how we can all move forward after the worst happens. It fills me with great hope because we have carved out some time to make this a priority. So in return for your time, here's what I promise you. We will be done on time. That means two o'clock on the nose Eastern time. That of course means a different time for you, but you will be honored because I know your time is valuable. That said, if you need to step away for whatever reason, this is being recorded. If a baby starts crying, this is being recorded. If your boss needs your attention, this is being recorded. So do not worry. The last thing I will say too before we begin is that in the chat, I welcome you to put your questions for the one and only Tembi Locke for Jenny Lisk, podcaster extraordinaire. So we will get to your questions, the ones that are the most broad and the most applicable to the most people are gonna be the ones we use because we want to have the most 
healing that we can possibly offer. So if it's very specific to you and your circumstance, um, just know that we have seen it, we have read it, we have digested it, but we're going to focus on those that are gonna be a bit broader and we'll get to your questions at about the halfway mark. So with that said, I do wanna start with Tembi Locke and welcome Tembi and I will get to you Jenny Lisk, I promise. So good morning Tembi. Good morning, good morning, thank you. How are you? It's such a pleasure to be here with everyone, to be in community and in conversation. I adore Jenny. Yeah. Um, she, we met, well, we'll tell the story of how we met many years ago, but um, I feel like we've been on parallel journeys for a while, so. Well, you know what? Let's just start there. We're nothing but nimble here. So <laughs> how did you and Jenny meet? And then I'll bring Jenny into the conversation to either corroborate or deny. Well, you know, everyone, memory is is very subjective. So I'm sure her version of our meet cute <laughs> will be different. Um, but no, it was for um, many of you may or may not know Soaring Spirits, which is an organization for widowed uh, people worldwide. And I was giving a presentation uh, in San Diego. I forget the year, but I want to say it was about three or four years after um, my late husband passed away. And I was doing a presentation on, if I recall, it was like sort of rebuilding. Jenny will tell, see, this is where memory fails you, right? <laughs> <We're> like <laughs> My widowed brain is like, what? Um, but in any case, Jenny was there and I kept making eye contact with her. Like I felt the whole time, like she was the most attentive recipient person in the classroom, I felt. And, and then afterwards she came up and she talked to me and I just felt like she had the most thoughtful questions. We had similar paths, similar touch points in our story. And I, and then she followed up and we kind of loosely stayed in touch over the years as I began to write my book. And then she wrote her book and started her podcast and I've been a guest and I don't know, it just feels very connected. So I I'm just honored that you have us together here today. Okay, so before I continue on Tembi, Jenny, is that memory, does that serve? Yep, yep. And it was 2016, I remember, because my husband had just died six months ago. Um, yeah. And that was my my first, well, only so far visit to Camp Widow. Uh, and you were doing that workshop on vision boards. That's so, what it was. Yes, yes, which was fabulous. So, yeah. Well, let me start, Tempe, um, with where I was meaning to begin, which is your journey into this conversation you met your husband uh, in Florence, Italy. Outside, if I'm remembering correctly, it was at a gelato shop and it was like you saw him and you were struck. Can you tell me about that moment that you met him? And um, just, I wanna be taken into that a little bit. Sure, absolutely. Um, I love telling the story because um, well, one, it's so deeply personal, but it has sort of all the magical qualities that I think, you know, um, those of us who've had our special person, you know, that that moment when you meet them, your life changes. And for me, I was a, um, a junior in college. I was doing my study abroad program, studying art history. And I was in Florence, learning Italian, eating a lot of pizza <laughs> and, you know, just being a 20 year old college student. And I was walking uh, uh, along the streets in Florence with a friend um, who I write about in the book. And the story is actually in my book from scratch. Um, <clears throat> and I round a corner and I bump into this man. And I mean, we literally physically collided, bumped into each other. And it was like, oh, excuse me, excuse me. Well, turns out the friend I was walking with knew him. So she facilitated this introduction. Turns out he's in a chef. He was a chef and he was, uh, his restaurant was nearby. And I, it was truly fate, destiny, all the things. And I kind of knew almost instantly because obviously he was super cute. <laughs> so there was all that, <laughs> you know, you had all the feels as the kids say these days, he gave me all the feels instantly. And that moment that faded first meet changed my life. And then he pursued me thereafter. And I won't give the rest of it away because it's in the book, but yes, we met outside of a gelateria in Florida. 
So your book, as you mentioned, is called For um, From Scratch. And what it's going to happen is remarkable because Reese, Reese Witherspoon selected it. Now it's going to become a Netflix series in the fall. Could not be a bigger deal. But I want to talk about that moment of diagnosis. And Jenny Lisk, hang in there. I haven't forgotten about you. Oh, but okay. the diagnosis was, um, from what you have shared, it was rare. Mm -hmm. It was soft tissue. Mm -hmm. It was bone cancer. Mm -hmm. This was sudden and alarming, unexpected, of course. And take us into that story for a moment before I then bring in Jenny to share about her meet cute story as well. Absolutely. Um, I would say, like I'm sure many of us on the call and many people who will listen to this later on, um, anytime you receive a sudden diagnosis, it is a life changing, a page one rewrite of the course of your life. And for me and for my late husband, Sato, his diagnosis was something called leiomyosarcoma. So he had a sarcoma um, and it's very, there are many types of sarcoma. His was leiomyosarcoma. It's not something I knew about. <laughs> uh, and we immediately had to, he immediately had to go into care and treatment and um, our life changed. And I instantly became a caregiver. Uh, and I was 31 years old at the time, and I had no peers or uh, friends who had a spouse who had a critical life-threatening illness. Um, and so I was in new territory. We both were. And I write about that in the book. And, um, and it's a part of that experience that I had as his caregiver led me to do the work I do today, which is also advocating not just for grief, which we'll talk about here today, but also for family caregivers. Thank you for sharing that with us. We are going to dig deeper for sure. I love the idea of that moment of literal com, you know, connection, the physical, the emotional, the just from the soul when you met him for the first time in Italy. And Jenny, uh, you were very young too when you lost um, your husband. And so I would love you to take us into your your meet cute, your meet cute story as Tembi with her Hollywood, you know, uh, has kind of started that conversation, but help us understand your story too, Jenny. Sure, sure. Well, mine is not a Netflix worthy uh, meet cute, but uh, we actually met, it was back in 1996. So it was two years after college. Um, and I had started this little teeny tiny business. I'm going to use in air quotes. It wasn't much of a business, but making websites. Um, for people. Now, 1986, right? This is a rudimentary days of websites. Wow. And long story short, um, I was walking around at a convention, you know, looking for people who might need websites. And he was there representing his organization with a table and brochures. And uh, I, you know, gave him my card. And then we ended up meeting. I did a website for them. And then at some point, you know, it kind of became like, mm, is he wearing a ring? You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we ended up uh, I ended up inviting him to go out with a group of friends, but it ended up being me and him and my friend Heather. So we joke about our first date with Heather because it was just the three of us. <laughs> so that's how we met. And then, uh, and we had uh, two kids that we adopted from Korea later. Um, and what do you, how far do you want me to go with this part? Yeah. So I, um, the way I come into your story, Jenny, is of course, I, uh, read and was so honored to see early copies of Future Widow, mm -hmm. your book. Now, of course, you had this wonderful podcast that I listened to, the Widowed Parent podcast, which I love and highly recommend. Help us know what happened. What was that pivot point for you? Yeah, so life was just like normal, right? Like we had we had two kids, they were in grade school, we both had jobs, and all of a sudden he started feeling a little bit dizzy one night. And you know, dizzy, I mean, I don't know, maybe he was dehydrated or tired, right? When you have two kids and full-time work and all this stuff, you're busy, you're tired. Well, it turned out that dizzy meant glioblastoma, which is a very, very aggressive brain cancer. I had never heard of it. 
since then, more people have heard of it because John McCain died of that and Bo Biden died of that. But at the time in 2015, when he got sick, I had never heard it. And in fact, we went in just for, you know, to find out about this dizziness. And they said, let's do an MRI. And then they called us back and said, there's something really wrong with your brain. You need to go to the neurosurgeon tomorrow. And, you know, I mean, that doesn't usually happen. And the neurosurgeon said, we're doing surgery the following day. And that was how it all started. And at first it was just a tumor, right? Some tumors are fixable. So we didn't know for sure what we were dealing with, but pretty quickly we found out it was this cancer with a single digit survival rate. Um, and he was sick for eight months and I was his caregiver like Tembi was, although for a much shorter period of time. I was hard enough doing it for eight months, Tembi. I think you were what, 10 years, did you say? 10 years. 10 years. Yeah, 10 years. that's a long, long time. I would love to bring Tembi back into this conversation. And I'm going to replay to you something that I heard while doing my prep for today's conversation. And I would love you to bring everyone here into what you mean by this. 40 steps, mm -hmm. 40 steps. S-T-E-P-S, if folks can't hear, um, 40 steps. Help us understand what that means in your healing journey, Tembi. Um, I gave a, a TEDx talk um, at, where I, I, I talk about my 40 steps. And my 40 steps, um, as I first illustrate them, are the 40 steps that it took me to walk to the room where my husband was passing away uh, in our home. He passed away and those 40 steps that I took back from the bed where he passed away to our bedroom to tell my daughter that he had passed and how in those 40 steps was the transition of my entire life. And then I understand that everyone will at some point take their own version of 40 steps where you are walking to a moment where when you return, everything will be different. And for me, um, you know, uh, it took me years to sort of understand it in that way, of course. Um, and I know because I remember, and, and those of us who have had this direct experience will understand, there's a kind of way in which time slows down and everything is stretched and elongated. And I remember taking, the, and these were steps that I took, you know, from my bedroom to, what was my office turned hospice space, you know, I, I took those steps every day. They were just 40 steps took every day, right? And, but though that time that I took them, the morning he passed away, had a different quality, obviously. And I like to talk to people about the fact that at some point, know that we will all take them, that we all need people to help us take those 40 steps to be there for the walk up and also the return from, um, because we need a lot of scaffolding emotionally to hold us up. And we can, um, we can do that for each other. So that's part of what I you know, love to talk about. And I really thank you, Allison, for bringing that forward. Um, um, because I, I, we, I think having gone through COVID now, I think we all have a deeper understanding. When I gave that talk, I think in 2015, 16, um, obviously, you know, talking about grief, <laughs> caregiving, loss, it was, you know, people would go, oh, well, that was nice. And they'd walk away, <laughs> you know, or something like that. But I think now we are more primed to listen, to lean in, to be curious, to listen to the stories of people who have walked those 40 steps, because I think we all understand at some point, we're gonna need to know about that. What struck me so much about that part of your talk is how it also not was personal for you and intimate, of course, because it was yours, but you also kind of shed the light on the experience for others, right? That this is going to be universal, if not now, perhaps later, but the caregiver experience that your experience could then be maybe of use yes. to other people, that there was meaning. There were two words that you used, 
unconditional love and connection, that these were some lessons that you learned that you wanted to carry forward. And Jenny, what I am so struck is that in a very different way, on parallel paths to what Tembi was going through, even the title of your book, Future Widow, you and I had discussions about the title of your book and how it was meant to be read in some ways by women who lose their spouses in the future, that you were writing to a future self or a future reader. And so again, just like Tembi, it pivoted to not just being about you. Tell me about that, Jenny. Yeah, it was really important to me that it not just be about me, right? And and this is one of the things that I really struggled with. <clears throat> Memoir as a genre is is interesting, right? I mean, you're writing something about yourself and your life, but I think every memoir writer wants to figure out how to make it applicable to more than just themselves. And I started out with with 15,000 words worth of Caring Bridge posts, right? I had posts documenting eight months worth of an inside look into a family going through a terminal illness and a family with children. Jenny, let me interrupt you for one second because I know what you just said. I'm familiar with that term. The caring is a caring bridge. Tell tell people what that is because they not may not be familiar with it. Yeah, caring bridge. And actually, a link in the chat would probably be um, helpful for folks. It's a it's basically an online free journal blog website. Um, and people use it if there's a, a medical crisis or a death or an emergency where they want to share out and keep people in the loop, the friends, the family who want to follow along. Um, and I actually thought in the beginning, oh, I'll, I don't need that. I'll just send some texts. I'll send some emails, kind of send some updates. And it pretty quickly became obvious that it was going to be unwieldy. Um, so anybody in that position, definitely check out Cambridge because it's super helpful. And I then you, it, don't have to, you don't have to repeat the same story. Yeah. And that's one of the things, time. I mean, Tembi, I don't know if you found, I found it exhausting. You know, you run into somebody, how are you? I'm like, oh my God, like, where do I start? How much do I know? Do I have to repeat this for the 5,000th time? Right. And so I could share out the updates. I completely agree, Jenny. And had I been as savvy as you, and I don't even know, my husband passed away in 2012. I don't even know. Caring Bridge may have been available. I didn't even know about it. Didn't even have the bandwidth to find it. But after 10 years of having been a, a cancer caregiver with all the ups and downs of that, I sort of had my core tribe and I had a communication, kind of like a phone tree. So mm -hmm. it was effectively the same thing for the people nearest and dearest to us. They had, I was one point person that I would give all the pertinent information to, and then it would fan out from there because you simply cannot repeat the same information over and over and over again. It's exhausting. Exhausting. Your energy is precious and it needs to go toward the person you're caring for or toward self-care or right. my case, children, in your case, right. children. Also. Right. Well, and so I ended up, you know, I started out uh, very matter of fact, you know, he's had surgery, he's out of surgery, here's the update, right? But over time, I started reflecting more and more on this journey and where it was headed and, <clears throat> excuse me, kind of what was going on. Um, and, and it actually, you know, there's a term that I didn't know called anticipatory grief. When you know, in this case, you know, I know he's going to die. I don't know when but I could start anticipating that future and start grieving. And I actually, for me, it was helpful to start processing um, as I would you know, be driving across the bridge to the hospital, I'd have 20 minutes by myself in the car to be thinking, what do I wanna to share to my followers next? And thinking about that helped me start processing, well, how do I feel about what's going on or how, you know, what am I struggling with? Um, and so, you know, back to your question about the book, I ended up with 15,000 words documenting kind of an inside view of eight months of a family with a parent with terminal illness. And people were telling me, oh, you should turn that into a book, right? And I thought, oh, it's, you know, it's, it feels like it's something. It's the start of a book, but I'm not sure that it's a book yet, right? There's got to be more to it. And so um, I ended up, and, you know, and to your question about the title, Future Widow, um, I, at the time, felt like I was walking around with a giant FW, future widow, like kind of like the scarlet letter, right, yeah. marked, and, and you know, I'd, I would go into the kids' school to pick them up or something, and I felt like all the eyes were on me, right, like, like they were probably looking at me and saying, oh, there's that poor woman whose husband is going to die soon, and I, and 
this they were all super supportive it's nothing about that i'm just saying i felt very much in the spotlight and so that was a re kind of a reflection of that period of time tebby from writing from scratch for being a part of this hollywood um remake or the making of from scratch into netflix what lessons were the non-negotiables that you had to get across for you to let's say approve the final manuscript of your book or to approve the series with netflix were there lessons or a lesson the most important lesson that was just kind of hey listen if i don't get to tell this we're not going forward here i really thank you for asking that question um because i'm going to go back to what to what jenny said which is that as a memoirist, as a storyteller, yes, you are bringing forward the specificity of your lived experience, but you're doing it, hopefully, <laughs> right? With the idea that something in your story touches the universal. That's really, and that, and for me, I was very clear that in writing the book, I wanted and hoped that people, any reader, who read the book and now who watches the series might have a slightly easier path than I had, perhaps by me telling the pitfalls, the things that, you know, were really pain, the painful inflection points that people might learn from them, right? So that sort of was a part of my conscious um, um, uh, motivations in terms of writing the book. And one of the things that I really wanted to, that I struggled with early on as a new writer and as a memoirist was whether or not to include or how to include the walk up to his death and being with him in his death. I felt that it was very intimate, it was very personal, but I also knew I had never had an experience like that and I'd never read an experience like that. And I felt as though people, wanted to know about that. I wished I had read books about that because it would help me be with a dying person in their, in their final hours, that there's value in that. You wanted it to be raw. You wanted it to be honest. Authentic. And, yeah. Authentic, honest, unfiltered. And I was scared to write that. I was scared of that chapter. I really hesitated. I almost didn't put it in the book. But I knew that the book wouldn't be the book without that. And I bring the reader right there with me in that room at that time to give an intimate front row seat. And so when it came to adapting the series, I asked myself a similar question. What parts are non, to your point, non-negotiable? And for me, a part of the work I do, my heart work, my advocacy work in the world is about shedding a light on what does it look like for a young family to go through this process. And I wanted the world hopefully to be able to see that dramatized on screen and to see how our industrial medical complex meets end of life through the lens of one family, one story. And hopefully by seeing that, they learn something if they are in that position or if they are helping a family who is going through that. And that was a non-negotiable for the series. Oh, that's yep. so fascinating. And Jenny, for you, was there any part that your editor, when you were writing Future Widow says too much, readers don't want that? No, in fact, the opposite. I ended up adding some things that I didn't, initially I, hadn't talked about um you know i felt very vulnerable right mm -hmm. and as, as, a, as a, in fact i should have realized that memoir is obviously a vulnerable genre and i knew it was but there's nothing like getting to impending publication of being like oh my god this is going to be out there right and now on the screen for you Timmy. uh but you know but and and, and allison i'll come back to that in a second but Timmy, what you were saying really reminded me of something that helped me when i was when i was freaking out about what to include and whether to go you know kill the whole thing uh i had heard julie lithcott hames who's a parenting author and a memoirist herself say that memoir is an act of service yes yes and that, and I actually wrote it on a sticky note and I put it above my computer. And every time I was like, oh my God, maybe I should, you know, fail on the whole thing. I would stare at that and say, all right, this is why I'm doing it because somebody 
I hope can learn something that I didn't know that could be helpful to them while their spouse is terminally ill or while they're parenting grieving kids or after they've lost their spouse and they're now widowed. Um, that is what kind of kept me centered and, and, and on track. And, and Allison, that also inspired me to add some things. Um, there, was a, there was a scene, you know, one of my early readers told me I had, had read it before I added that scene and then I added it and she's like, oh my God, that took chutzpah to add that. Uh, there's a scene we were watching Seinfeld because we had nothing else to do, right? Because he was in bedridden and, you know, and so we just watched TV all the time because he was cognitively confused. And we had all these Seinfeld DVDs. Well, if you've ever watched Seinfeld, you know, they talk a lot about sex. Yeah. So we get to the end of one of the episodes and he's like, maybe we should try that sometime. Yes. Oh my God. Like, so I was like, try what? Because, because I can't stress how con enough, how confused he was. And I wasn't ever sure what he understood or didn't. And he was, and he was like, S-E-X. <laughs> and he spelled it out like that, which is not normal what he would talk. That's not normally how he would talk about these things, right? <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, this like, and so finally I was like, okay, I don't know, maybe it'll be fun. But I was like, also, maybe it's now or never, right? So I am not going to go into the details here, but it was just a disaster and because of the cognitive confusion. But the point as an author in the book, I hesitated to talk about that because it was so personal and it was so I hadn't I hadn't put that on Caring Bridge when it happened. Right. That there was some stuff I didn't share. But as I was pushing to like, all right, what what is the act of service here? What is going to help people? What is real about caregiving that people may not have thought of. Diapers is another one, right? I didn't, should have occurred to me, of course, that diapers might be involved in caregiving, but it never had occurred to me until we got involved in this, right? It's like, all right, I'm going to loop back and add that because this is real and this is going to help somebody um, with an inside view, Tembi, like you said, of writing about something that you hadn't seen elsewhere and maybe it would help somebody. I wonder about the dates and times and what editors feel is acceptable these days and how social media has changed our ability to digest and be receptive to that level of honesty. And I'll tell you an example. And I, then I'm going to go to the chat and I'm going to enter Christina, who's going to go to the chat and ask Christina to dole out the question. So again, as a friendly reminder, if you have a question burning for Tembi Locke, this is your moment. Uh, it is so rare to get her here to answer your burning questions. Please do take advantage of it. And with Jenny, not all of us can be so fortunate to be on her podcast. And so please, if you have questions for Jenny Lisk, um, please put them in the chat. But what I was gonna get to before I go to your questions is that when I was writing my book, Parentless Parents, it was about having lost both my mom and my dad within relative short succession and raising my two young children without my parents. And I was so cracked open and raw. And I think it was coming out in an unedited kind of tidal wave of vomit. And my editor really needed to um, help me dial back and synthesize and make more meaning out of my feelings, which was really helpful in all ways to have a good editor like that. But there was one place we actually disagreed and I'll just share with you this quick anecdote and I haven't thought about it. It must be in 10 years, so forgive me. Because I was so young when my parents died, I had a passage in the book that has since been, that was cut out and I should go look for it now, where I felt that the obituary photographs in the New York Times, let's say, that have young smiling faces looking out at you was really masking the intensity of my parents' deaths, that they were frail and they were sick 
and they didn't need diapers like what you were just saying, Jenny, but they needed everything else. And there was that raw ugliness of what that looks like. And I was railing against what those pretty pictures in the obits look like and what they felt to me as being dishonest. That if we're really being honest about death, the pictures in those obits would be that person as they were, as awful as they appeared when they died. That was a bridge too far and my editor cut that all out. Mm -hmm. And so it's just interesting about, maybe it was poorly written. Yeah, I don't know, but it was also maybe um, too physical, too much ooze, too much honesty. And I'm wondering kind of where that dial is. And I imagine we all have that dial in different ways. We're talking about your podcast, Tembi, where we're of course talking about your Netflix series and your book, but we all have dials in our personal lives, right? Everyone here who's listening right now has a filter when you talk to your friends, when you talk to your coworkers, and I'm wondering where you feel that filter is. Can we be as honest as we want to be? And I'm just putting it out there as a question. So Christina, I would love you to start going through the chat. Um, if you don't want to put your question, I know Christina has said in the chat, if you don't want to put your question to your name and you want to do it anonymously, Christina, raise your hand. You can send Christina a Hello. private message and then she will not give it away about who wrote that question, but please, this is your opportunity. So Christina, what do we have so far? Okay, the first question is anonymous. It says, my husband had cancer, but his death was unexpected when it came. How do you cope with things left unsaid and regrets? Tembi. Yeah, um, I understand that and I had time to have conversations and I have feelings of of, of things that were left unsaid. And so one of the things that I found early on, and I still to someday do them, is I have a kind of an ongoing conversation with my late husband in the form of journaling and letters. And what I'm doing there, and to some degree, one could say on the surface, it's a one-sided conversation, <laughs> clearly, <laughs> um, but it's actually not. And I, what I mean by that is um, I'm still, in a kind of a conversation and dialogue with him about what is unfolding now. We have a child, the kind and quality of her life. But also I take the big questions to him. He was my best friend. He was my lover, my life partner, the father of my child. And so I think we do ourselves a disservice or let me just say, let me rephrase it and say, I feel there is an opportunity if you are open and available to that, to explore being in conversation with your beloved and doing that either on the paper in the form of journaling, either taking walks in nature and talking to them. And it's not so much that there's some literal answer that will come down through the trees or through the gods or in that way, but what you're really doing is opening up yourself and your heart to saying, I know you were here and you would want the best for me. I wish I had said this to you. I wish I knew what you would think of this moment right now. And just doing that shifts the energy a little bit in a way that it kind of helps you relax, or at least I should say helped me relax, helps me relax and acknowledge that I'm missing you, that I'm wishing we could still have this conversation, that I'm regretting something that was left unsaid. So in some way, I hope that that's my direct lived experience. If that offers anything to you, you know, I, I hope it does. I love that. That's really about how we move forward, right? That's an answer that kind of goes in many directions. It's about how we live in honor of a relationship as well. Christina. We received another anonymous question. Um, this one's about home loan payments specifically, but maybe one of you could talk about estate planning and making financial decisions more generally. Do you want to jump in, Jenny? I have 
some thoughts, but you go well, first. Well, um, you know, it's interesting. I've, I've interviewed a pe few people recently on my show about this because a lot of widowed people do have questions um, about this. And I think that, you know, one of the things I've gotten out of these discussions is find a, some, you know, somebody who can help you, a certified financial planner, perhaps, um, somebody who can help think through, because there's a lot of administrative stuff. There's a lot of um, options. And I think, you know, a lot of, I hear from a lot of people uh, with, you know, widow brain or grief brain, right? And so it's at the time when you have all these decisions potentially to make and you're, you know, not yourself in whatever respect. Um, so that can be helpful to have someone there. And the other thing is, you know, it's often said, try not to make any major decisions for a while if you don't have to make those decisions urgently. Um, and so if something can be pushed to a time when maybe you have more time or energy to think about it, um, I think that can be helpful too. Not always possible, but sometimes it is. Yeah, and what I would add to that as someone who advocates for family caregivers, I say bringing that person on early, as early as you can in the process, like kind of at diagnoses or shortly thereafter. And I know you don't have the bandwidth, most caregivers to do that work. So really this is a message and it's a call out to the people nearest and dearest to the caregiver to say, help this family out, help this potentially future widow out by aligning her with a trusted professional, ideally someone who has worked exclusively or a great deal with estate planners or knows this transit landscape. And what you're doing is coming in and developing that relationship early so that after loss, you're not looking through the phone book going like, who is that person, right? And can I trust them? And, and when your senses are a little off, everything to Jenny, that Jenny just said is it, it's really hard to bring someone new into your life at that point. So if the opportunity exists early, please do. If you're a relative, a family, a friend, a coworker, do that for your person. <laughs> really help the family out in that way. Um, because all of those decisions that are gonna have to come, all of that administration, administrative help um, is an unbelievable mountain. It, feel, it felt like a lot, especially the first year. And I really, um, needed that assistance and a trusted voice. So please do that. And I would just add, there are some financial planners who specialize in working with people who've been widowed. And so then they have, you know, they have kind of you know, bring a grief sensitive lens to it, as well as expertise in the particular financial issues. I'm going to interrupt for one second, Christina, as you get your next question ready. Um, for some inexplicable reason, my low battery light has come on my computer, even though I'm plugged in, which clearly means that my charger is not working. So Christina, uh -oh. as you answer or ask the next question, I'm gonna turn off my camera just for a second, charge into another outlet, but I'm here, I'm listening. Just give me one second, Christina, ask the next question. Okay. Thank you. Um, this is a question for Tembi. It's from Jill. She says, I read from scratch, but the question remains, how did you reopen your heart to love again after your loss of sorrow? And she also adds, and I'm so happy that you have. Oh, thank you, Jill. Thank you. Um, wow. That is that <laughs> Jill, that is a big question and almost one for like another book, which I'm not saying I'm writing. <laughs> oh, you should, you should. <laughs> I've been thinking about it, actually. Um, I, I, the how, I, I, let me just say this. I don't know about if I can answer the how as directly as I can, the why. The why to open my heart again. Um, I'll tell a funny, brief, funny story, which will help, which is being with my then 11, 12-year-old daughter. We were at a, in a strip mall at a Chinese restaurant and the busboy refilled my water glass and she turned to me and she goes mommy he gave you extra water he has a crush on you <laughs> you should date him <laughs> so clearly I thought to myself holy moly <laughs> what am I modeling for this child and you know no slight against the bus boy by the way <laughs> lovely man but she was seeing something that I 
I had closed off a whole part of my life and my heart and what she was saying in her unfiltered preteen self was, hey mom, this might be nice. Had you thought about this? And I thought, oh, okay, that's not for her to hold and think about in that way. And I also began to ask myself very deeply, what does full living really mean? And I had had the blessing, if you've read the book, you know, that Sado said to me, I want you and I hope you will find love again because he understood the interior of my heart. And I didn't like it when he said that. And I write about that in the book. But after his passing, I circled back to that moment and I began to understand what he was attempting to say to me in a different lens. And I asked myself, well, what would it look like to try? And so that's the kind of the why I came into it. And then the how was, you know, as mercurial and odd as all, like, how do you meet anybody, <laughs> you know? Um, but that's a part of the why is I felt like I owed it to myself and to him. And I, I mean, I, what I mean by owing it to him is, is, is that, that way that he, he would want me to be happy. I want to take that thought and just amplify it for a moment. I was anticipating having been so familiar with your work, Tembi, and of course, Jenny's too, that there becomes a time where we can allow ourselves to change direction and move forward in a lighter um, mm -hmm. way. That doesn't mean we're leaving our loved one behind completely and irreversibly. It just means we're bringing them forward in a different way. And when Andy introduced me today, he mentioned very briefly about my new book that's coming out in the fall. It's about this woman named Elsie Robinson, who no one remembers, but she was a writer. And she writes a lot about grief, which of course is one of the reasons why I became in love with her. And I was writing about her and learning from her. And there's a poem that she wrote. She also was a poet about how we move forward with our grief. And some of these words are written more than a hundred years ago. She died back in the 1950s. She was born in the late 1800s. So if you bear with me, these are just a few stanzas that I love so much. And then hopefully you'll be in love with her too. Putting on my old lady glasses. So hold on one second. We're all, we're all with you on that. Okay. Glasses game. <laughs> yeah. So here we go. Easy enough to raise a monument to grief. But how shall one build monuments to joy? A slab of stone? No, stone's too cold. And dead. Your body died and with it half my heart. But not one throb of our warm love has cooled. It burns as brightly as before you passed. So why mark a living love with piles of cold, dead stone? Then what can I do to show the world and you that love goes on triumphant, that love always pays? I can live, I'm gonna repeat that. I can live of my own life. I'll build your monument. Mm. I wow, feel that very similar, Tempe, to what you were just getting to. Uh, that leaves me, that leaves me breathless because there is this subtle or not so subtle thing for a widowed people and sometimes people will say it's gendered and it's more for women than for men wherever you whatever your belief on that spectrum the reality is is that there is a a kind of pivotal point where you begin to say with this one precious life i have mary oliver with this one precious life how can i live fully that both honors my lived experience while holding with me, bringing you and the monument to your love and to your life along with me. 
Yes. Say, yes. You know, in my repartnering, my late husband is a part of that whole equation because he's a, a part of me. And whomever you choose to, if you choose to repartner with someone, they're along for that journey. The same way if I'd lost a sister or if I'd lost, you know, uh, a best friend, God forbid, a child, you know, I would want to talk about that, that love with my partner. Well, I get to talk about my late husband with my partner. Well, that's, be, that's bringing your whole self to a new partnership, right? That's being open and cracking yourself open to fullness. And that's bringing your, your whole lived experience to the new partnership. Jenny, does this resonate for you in terms of how you've chosen to move forward or does this not kind of fit right? Yeah, as you read the end of that, it, it caused me to actually dive into the acknowledgements part of my book here. I had to find this because of what it reminded me. I have Did you mention these... Elsie Robinson? No, 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 but I didn't know about her then. But I acknowledged all these people and I ended with this and my husband's name was Dennis. Mm -hmm. To Dennis, thank you for the honor of being your wife. Your life was far too short. I promise to make the most of mine. Mm. Mm. And I, you know, and I... I really feel like he, you know, he lived to 44. It's kind of a half of a life. I don't know if it's half, but right, just roughly speaking, let's say that's half of what he quote unquote should have gotten. And I thought, okay, that's, that's tragic, right? It's tragic for him. It's tragic for our family. I can't change it. And if I, I didn't die, right? So he got half a life. If I kind of half-heartedly live out the rest of my life, that just compounds the tragedy. And since I can't, I have no magic wand to undo the fact that he died. I can't, it's a fact at this point. I cannot change that. What I can control is what I do. And I have to choose and I get to choose what the rest of my life is going to be. I think that's so important because sometimes I know for me too, when my mother first died and I was so young and then my father soon thereafter, it's like some of us, myself included for a time, felt guilty moving on, being happy, enjoying life, going to a party. How could I celebrate and you know eat good food or see a beautiful view that they are not going to eat and they're not going to see? And I know Tembi, of course, in your book, there are recipes, right? Because your husband was all about food. He was a chef. And so there's a way of integrating our senses into this lived living and lived grieving experience. And I also wanna make sure that I know we are eight minutes from being done. However, I would be remiss if I didn't remind you that the conversation may be over here, but it's not over forever because you can connect with Tembi and you can connect with Jenny and you could still be connected all over social media. So let me just pause and let me tell you how you can connect with these wonderful human beings. So Jenny is on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram under Lisk Jenny. So not Jenny Lisk, but Lisk Jenny. Of course, we know her book is Future Widow. Her podcast, please go to your podcast and download it, The Widowed Parent Podcast. And Tembi, uh, Tembi Lock on Instagram, your account is just ballooning and it's going to be ballooning even more when the series comes out on Netflix. And I do have a question in my research, Tembi, Root and Rise. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that right now, where it yeah. stands. Yes, exactly. So Root and Rise was a kind of, it was born in the pandemic and it was a conversation series that I was having over Zoom. It is dormant now, but re-emerging as a new podcast that will launch in the fall, um, probably early, mid-October. Um, and so stay tuned for that. You can find that on my website. It will clearly be on my Instagram account, but it will be a conversation series is about um, these sort of inflection points and moments when things change and how we lean into our resilience and we reimagine and go forward. 
And of course, that was a perfect segue for our host, Reimagine. Let's Reimagine on Instagram. We probably didn't mean that, but it, that was awesome. Uh, let's underscore Reimagine on Twitter and Reimagine End of Life on Facebook. And of course, we would all not be here if it wasn't for the generous um, support of For Grief. And I will mention, besides their regular Instagram, there is a For Grief community page. So if you request to enter, this is where the conversation really can continue. So if you're here and you're dying to kind of continue venting, sharing, laughing, crying, giggling, whatever it is that you need to do, go on that for grief community page. And that way this can, uh, continue, please, because I always hate kind of being done at the strike of the hour. Um, but I do have one last question. Um, and I know, Christina, we can do a lightning round of other reader, you know, listener questions too. But here is my question just about parenthood. We've talked a little bit about that. Jenny, you and I have done a lot of work with the National Alliance for Children's Grief. And I'm wondering if you can each speak as mothers what has been the most helpful thing do you feel that we can collectively do for our nieces, for our nephews, for our children, and for our grandchildren? If you were to boil it down to a piece of advice, what would that be, Tembi? Uh, I would say, listen to their words, right? Listen to them, make space for them to talk about the parent that has passed, listen to their stories, but also watch their behavior. And what I mean by that is children, especially young children who may not be able to verbalize the intensity or the complexity of what they are feeling will often act it out in some way. And so being able to interpret that behavior, which will sit on the spectrum. <laughs> it can look like being very quiet and saying nothing and be shy, or it can look like very active, hyperactive or anger or lashing out, but there's a message therein. And so um, not shutting that down, but actually leaning into that, which I know is very, very hard for parents to do, <laughs> um, especially when we are grieving. So I would say, um, listen to them and make space for them. Thank you. So changes of behavior. Uh, Jenny, before I let you answer that same question, I just saw two seconds ago, a note pop up in the chat and it says, who wrote the poem? So sorry to interrupt again. It's Elsie Robinson. If you want the poem, I'm happy to email it to you. You won't find it. You know, everything is kind of like not digitized from that long ago, at least as far as Elsie has been concerned. So I know I mentioned Tembi's social media and Jenny's and reimagines and for grief. And of course, I forgot to mention anything about me. But if you want to email me, email me, I'll send you the poem. You know, that's fine with me. I'm in love with Elsie, to be honest. And I only found out about her because my mother died. That's another story for another day, but it's because of my mother's death that I even found out the name Elsie Robinson. So just email me. Um, Christina, maybe put my email in the link. That's fine. Jenny, uh, back to you. We have my eyes, two minutes left, go. Uh -huh. Okay, well, this could be a whole nother webinar, a whole nother topic, but uh, mm -hmm. I, you know, I think one of the most important things is how important it is to be honest with kids, even about difficult topics or especially about difficult topics, grief, death, cause of death. Sometimes people don't want to tell kids if it's something that's difficult, like suicide or a stigmatized death of some kind. Um, but it turns out that that bond of trust between the surviving parent and, and the kid is so, so important. And it's important to send the message that, that the door is open for discussion, for these conversations, right? So even if the kid doesn't want to talk about it today, even if the kid doesn't want to talk about it tomorrow, you're still you're kind of sending the message that this topic isn't taboo. Yes. Right. So maybe they do want to talk about it next week or next year or some other time. Um, and keeping that door open for the conversations. A lot of times kids, they, they don't want to upset their surviving parents. So they're afraid to bring up something if they're sad about dad or they're struggling with something or, or mom, whichever you know parent has died. Um, so keeping that door open is is so, so important. And, and, and Allison, one more link for the chat. You mentioned the National Alliance for Children's Grief. Yes. Childrengrief.org. 
um, has a place you can go there and find grief centers in many, many communities around the country. And I'd encourage listeners to, uh, to go check that out because there are grief support programs for kids and, and families. I 100% agree. You, you and I both do that wonderful work with the National Alliance for Children's Grief, NACG. Uh, and so I appreciate you bringing their important work up. So Andy from Reimagine, Christina, thank you for all your help. Thank you to For Grief. Tembi Locke is in the house for this last hour. What an honor and a privilege. We will all be watching from scratch on Netflix. Go buy the book. What a great thing to do. Buy the book, then watch the series on Netflix. Jenny, please listen to her podcast. She has amazing conversations. It's called the Widowed Parent Podcast, although the topics are not just for widows, in my view, I think it's really helpful to anyone who is struggling with grief. And of course, your book, The Future Widow. So everyone, as promised, it's the strike of two in New York. I'm going to say thank you so much. I will see you next month at the same uh, at the same time. So thank you again for your time. I'm so, so honored. Thank you, Allison. Timmy, great to see you again. Good to see you, Jenny. Thank you, Allison. Thank you, Reimagine. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thanks for Thank coming. You.